So it's 3.30. Uh, thank you for joining our European University Institute Asia Project Workshop. My name is Ken Endo, uh, professor at the University of Tokyo and part-time professor here at the European University Institute. I'm glad that you know, this uh, such Eurocentric institution has established a sort of bridgehead on Asian studies here. Uh, you know, thanks to the heroic uh, leadership of Eric and uh, Julio and, and Mia too. So, uh, 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 you know, and, and this workshop is the latest and uh, among so many. And this time dealing with the Japan, US, uh, China power politics. And for in the previous session, assessing the current state of interstate relations, especially between Japan and China. Uh, in this session, uh, we intend to treat the historical issues uh, and nationalism, a sort of uh, interface between domestic and the inter, uh, international politics. Now, and it could be seen as a sort of timely event uh, as, uh, you know, uh, this coincides the you know Polish government's uh, request or demand uh, asking Germany to pay something like 1.3 trillion euro uh, reparations for the wartime damages. Uh, so history issues is, is far from over uh, here in Europe as well as obviously in Asia. Now we gladly have a set of uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, uh, you know, first uh, uh, Professor Caroline Rose uh, uh, at the University of uh, Leeds. Um, uh, she's specialized in Sino-Japanese relations and Japanese foreign policy. She's going to give a talk on the burden of history and Japan. Then second speaker is uh, Dr. Reinhard uh, Drift uh, next to me. Uh, from Newcastle University, a long-time watcher of uh, Eastern Asia, and especially Japanese politics and international relations. Uh, he shares his views on China's history issue between domestic and international politics. And as announced, unfortunately, we miss Mike uh, Mochizuki, unable to show up, a pity, because I was really looking for seeing him uh, after such a long time. Anyway, um, uh, here, the, in place of Mike, we will have a few words each from Julio and uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Baca uh, uh, on the scheduled topic of US government's stance on the history issue. Uh, we will, we intend to finish uh, this session by uh, 4.40 uh, in uh, Florence European time. Uh, each speaker has, say, 12, 15 minutes, perhaps, Max. Um, uh, so the floor is Caroline's. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Very good. Okay. Um, my other problem might be that my internet might crash. I'm in a different venue this afternoon. So I'm just fingers crossed that I can get through the next 11 minutes with an internet connection intact. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is, is the results of um, rather many more years of research than I care to admit towards a book that isn't yet out in, in the public domain yet, but will be, I hope. And I've been charting the content of Chinese and Japanese social studies textbooks at primary and middle school level. So that's history, geography, uh, civics and uh, morality in the case of China. Um, and um, so I'm going back to my first love, which is textbook content. And as we've already um, heard from Kokobun Sensei earlier on, in fact, history issues uh, have been fairly low down the agenda on, in Sino-Japanese relations for the last few years, which um, for many people is a good thing. For me, it's rather sad because it almost puts me out of a job. Um, however, there is actually quite a lot still to say about textbook content relating to the sorts of narratives that you've all been talking about this morning. So these strategic narratives and these these um, myths, uh, these national myths that Ian and her uh, 
talked about in her excellent book. Um, so actually there's quite an interesting story to tell. So what I'd like to do in this next 10 minutes is just give you some highlights or some lowlights of um, the, the changes I've been seeing in the content of uh, Japanese textbooks. I won't talk about Chinese textbooks, that could be a talk for another day. I'll sort of hint at it on the final screen, but that's obviously something that Reinhard will be talking about. Um, but if we if we go back a few years, eight, ten years ago, um, in those Genron NPO opinion polls that Takada Sensei was talking about, um, the history issues used to loom quite large in the reasons behind China's dislike of Japan and Japan's dislike of China. I'm sorry, this isn't a very clear image, but essentially what I hope you can see is that rather high up in the sort of 70% range, 60 or 70% range on in terms of Chinese sentiment towards Japan. History, Japan's lack of apology and remorse over, over the history of invasion of China was one of the main reasons that Chinese um, uh, dislike of Japan was so strong. Um, if we fast forward uh, to the most recent poll, you'll see actually that that has really dropped down the agenda for obvious reasons, for all of the reasons that you guys have been talking about this morning, not least uh, disputes around the territorial conflict and this, this real hike in mistrust between China and, and Japan. So the history problem as such has really dropped in terms of um, awareness in opinion polls. And as Kokobun Sensei said this morning, you know, the history issue has is, is sort of is slightly disappeared uh, out of view for the time being. I don't think it's gone because actually nothing has changed and nothing has been resolved. And if you look, for example, at you know, recent um, issues in South Korea, Japan relations, textbook content and disputes around the comfort women are absolutely hot topics. So I think this is just an example of an issue that is waving at the moment because other issues are absolutely front and center. Uh, so what I what I wanted to really just sort of talk, talk about um, in very broad terms is that the background to what I see in terms of changes in textbook content. And for me, there's been in Japan, a gradual shift in educational policy uh, from the 1990s right through to Abe 2.0. And so in the 1990s, we think things like the legalization of the flag and anthem, uh, the insertion of a patriotism clause in the sort of curriculum guidelines in the late 1990s. And then when Abe comes into power first time and then second time, he, he sort of really puts in place a, a grand plan on education, and this is his educational revival uh, plan. And so this gets underway in 2006-7, and then he picks, he picks up where he left off when he comes back into office in 2012. And there's a whole series of really rather more interventionist positions taken by the government and the Ministry of Education on different aspects of Japan's education. And it, it's not just about history textbooks, it's around the whole curriculum in its entirety and what that stands for. So uh, one of his first major successes in this area, as far as he was concerned, was the revision of the fundamental law of education. And then that was followed after 2014 with some fairly um, uh, outstanding uh, changes to the, the textbook authorization standards and um, a series of cabinet decisions that have made ended up uh, making rather quick changes in textbook content. One of the things that I think we have to understand about the textbook system in Japan is that it's been fairly slow to change. Um, curriculum guidelines change every 10 years and then textbooks are altered every few years, but the, the underlying narrative and the underlying messages haven't actually changed very much. And so what I'm always looking for are the minutest of changes and the subtlest of changes. And this can be around a word in a sentence or the removal of a word in a sentence or the removal of a footnote or the addition of a footnote. So I'm really looking at a micro level, but actually those micro changes for me symbolize something much bigger in terms of an, an alignment of uh, educational content with the shifting master narratives. And I'll give you some examples of that in the next few slides. Um, as, we, as we come on to Abe 2.0, the main 
focus seems to have shifted away from the, the content that we used to talk about in relation to textbooks, which, which was the Asia Pacific War, towards contemporary issues. So events like the Senkaku Islands and all of the other territorial disputes or not um, that Japan uh, encounters. So territorial education is a thing <laughs> in Japan as it is now in China. Um, there are still issues around uh, particular descriptions of the Asia Pacific War, so around the comfort women, around forced labor. There's been a whole debate around how to describe collective security in textbooks, and that is now firmly inserted in civics textbooks. And then one of the other major developments, though not this is not something I look at in my in my own book, but it's the formalization of dotoku of morals as a, as a subject in its own right within the school curriculum. And this has caused all sorts of concerns uh, domestically in Japan along the, the usual sort of lines, the, the cleavages between the left and the right in Japan, where the right have been pushing for many, many years since the 1950s for the reinstatement of dotoku and the, those on the left have really challenged that and, and been opposed to it. Well, in the last few years, Dotoko has uh, been reinstated as a, as a formal subject. And there's some rather interesting uh, preliminary discussions of what Dotoko textbooks look like. And I'd encourage you to look at those if you're interested. If the, the Spremberg article in particular is interesting because he looks at the content of uh, Dotoko textbooks on the Asia Pacific War. And he looks at the way the victim narrative uh, is, is portrayed in those books. So uh, what I just want to show you some examples of is the way in which territorial education and some of the changes related to comfort women and forced labor descriptions have um, been incorporated and how they have been uh, greeted by uh, China. Um, I, I think, um, oh, sorry, th this, this is just about um, the daughter could uh, textbooks, the, the new textbooks, and this is a, a this is picked up um, in the Jungang um, Ilbo. So, so this is a, a comment that um, patriotism is is sort of being uh, heavily encouraged in these new Japanese textbooks, and that students are being encouraged to sort of do a self scoring uh, system to um, to test their patriotism. So, the line behind all of the recent changes in, in Japan's textbooks has been this a key message around the need to inculcate greater patriotism in school children. But we get the same in China, we actually get the same in the UK uh, and in other, in other educational systems. So this in itself is not groundbreaking or shocking, but the way in which it is done in Japan is seen, at least from the progressives on the left, as something deeply concerning and deeply worrying. And it's also seen that way from the South Korean government and the Chinese government. So I'll just give you some examples of, of the sort of changes that have been made and the way in which the uh, Chinese have, have responded. Um, starting about 10 years ago, uh, territorial education came to the fore in Japanese education policy. And this sort of linked up with the newly um, created Office of Policy Planning and Coordination on Territory and Sovereignty. And there's, it's quite an interesting website to trawl through if you're interested. Um, and they weighed in obviously very heavily on the need for uh, textbook content to more accurately reflect and to, uh, the, the, the current state of uh, territorial issues between Japan and China and South Korea and Russia. And so there was a concerted effort therefore to um, ensure that textbooks starting at primary then moving to middle and now high school textbooks should all contain a certain uniformity around the message that uh, all of these islands are um, inherent territories of Japan. And so that the, this chain, these changes have been made uh, since 2015-16. What I think was particularly interesting about this was the fact that it was highly interventionist that um, the, the decision that this particular phrase that that the islands and the Senkaku Islands and the Northern Territories and the, and the Dokdo Islands are inherent territories. This particular phrase was insisted upon by um, the government, by the Ministry of Education, which by cabinet decision, by cabinet fiat, 
um, made sure that textbook um, publishers had to uh, submit their textbooks for correction almost out of season. And this happened very, very quickly in 2014, 15, so that within the space of six months a year, textbook publishers had to submit their revised texts. And the textbooks change, you may not think significantly, but for me, when I see a shift from um, a couple of lines on one page, uh, referring, you know, fairly vaguely to the territories when that changes to a full page spread with little boxes around uh, describing each of the territories that is quite a major change in a textbook where word limits are very closely guarded and where you have to get through a, a syllabus by a certain point in the year to get through the exams so this was a fairly major change as far as i could see not least in terms of how the territories were presented, but the way in which the decisions were made, which was an out of season series of decisions made at, at governmental level. And so now we've, we've gone through a whole cycle and textbooks from primary right through to high school now have a very similar sort of full page spread on uh, the nature of territorial disputes or not um, around uh, uh, around uh, this, this very sensitive issue. And of course that follows the narrative that we've seen played out over the uh, various disputes in the last few years. So, so territorial education is quite an interesting development in, in civics textbooks. Um, there's some reference in history textbooks too, but it's mainly in civics textbooks. Uh, and, and the Chinese government has of course been monitoring the content and the changes, as it always has done. And uh, every March, April, when the changes to textbook content are published um, by the Japanese government, uh, the press always comment on this in Japan and China also just follows, follows the story. And so even though this is fairly low key and we haven't had the big historical disputes that we've had in the past, nonetheless, there's just an, you know, a note and there's a protest and diplomatic protest and a conversation that's, that's taking place where China and of course, more vocally South Korea recently, just uh, shows that it's aware of the changes that are taking place around Nanjing Massacre or Comfort Women and the claim to disputed islands. So this was from 2016, but those uh, protests come up to the present day as well. Um, and so you, you continue to get in the Chinese press, the Chinese communist press, uh, just the, you know, the odd reminder here and there, just so that we know it hasn't dropped off the agenda completely and that the Chinese government continues to monitor very closely the content of Japanese history and civics and geography textbooks. So this um, was a, uh, last year, 2021, uh, a comment um, about the, the changes that have been made uh, to comfort women dis descriptions in Japanese textbooks. And this is another example of the way in which the Japanese government has intervened and uh, enforced and instructed Japanese textbook publishers to resubmit their textbooks for a correction of specific parts of the textbook so that the, the term military comfort women it has gone completely and um, it's all been replaced with comfort women without the word military Nihon. Uh, and um, so this is a very recent um, issue. And of course, if you followed this, it's certainly um, incurred the wrath of the South Koreans. And there's an example here. I'm sorry, this is all in, in Japanese, but what I've tried to highlight here, this is taken from uh, the newspaper article before, but in, in the highlights, you've got Nihongun Iyan Fuseido. So in the previous versions of the textbook, some textbooks referred to the military comfort women system. And after the corrections that enforced by the Japanese government, uh, Nihongun Japanese army has, has gone. Similarly with um, references to forced labor, uh, the Denko Sara, the, the, the forced bit of forced labor has been removed. So this is in relation to uh, Koreans and indeed Chinese who were forced um, into uh, factories and mines to work during the war. So, so that, there are these slight shifts, but I think there are important shifts that we just have to be aware of because it just speaks to that um, continuation of 
the implementation of historical re revisionism, um, certainly since Abe came to power the second time. I just, I think there's just a few more slides if you'll just uh, bear with me. Um, this, this is uh, the most recent um, uh, response by China. Um, again, to uh, most recent textbook changes in high school history textbooks, I think this time. And uh, so this China's response, of course, um, to any changes in, in Japanese textbook content that refers to the, the Senkaku Islands as Japan's inherent territory is, of course, the rejoinder that these are China's inherent territory. So again, this is just flagging up that the Chinese government is, is very carefully watching um, these these changes, um, but not necessarily ratcheting up the issue to a to a higher diplomatic level. I should I'm going to finish now because there's lots more I could say, uh, and I don't want to step on Reinhardt's toes. But I should say that also my study, which looks at both Chinese and Japanese textbooks, shows very interesting changes in Chinese textbook content as well. And again, that completely complements what was said in the in the earlier panel about these changing narratives. So. Um, Chinese textbooks also have been relatively so slow to change over the years. Um, and again, it's a matter of looking at slightly different wording uh, or paragraphs that go, that go missing in one cycle and reappear in another cycle. But in the last few years, again, there have been many more changes that have happened much more quickly. Um, in descriptions of the war of resistance, for example, the, I think the issue that hit the headline a few years ago was that the war, the, the description of the war of resistance against Japan has changed to 14 years. It hadn't changed, actually, it was a matter of reorganizing the material, um, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a catchy headline. But what I think is more interesting is the uh, view that China now really pushes in its narrative of the of the war is is China as a key ally, as a key player in the global anti-fascist war. So China is elevating its position in that particular narrative. And then and then finally, the most recent changes is the very um, rapid introduction of a whole new set of textbooks, um, starting at primary school, going through to middle, on uh, moral morality and law, Dada Yufaja. So this is mor morality and law. This is um, an another set of new textbooks to replace a, a set that had only, I think, been um, been uh, distributed in schools for a few years. And, and the background to all of this is, is Xi Jinping and his agenda and the need to get gain greater control over textbook content in China. Unified textbooks are now the norm. There used to be some pluralism and some marketization of the textbook system that's gone now. And, and this, is all of, this is all about Xi Jinping and Xi Jinping thought and the Chinese dream, all of the things you were talking about earlier on and a much greater emphasis on tradition and culture. So there's there's much more that I could say about Chinese textbooks, but I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm probably over time, I apologize. Great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the, uh, you have so effectively reviewed the sort of incremental process of uh, historical revisionism in Japan uh, in the field of education uh, you know, based on the school textbook uh, analysis. Well, thank you very much indeed. So may I pass this floor to... Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I took on this assignment with such some trepidation uh, after Caroline Rose, who has written about it and so on. And uh, I mean, I have always been very interested in the history issue as a German, but also now as a French citizen. And uh, I find it uh, very, very important f to understand the relationship between the, uh, the two countries, or shall we say, between the three countries in Northeast Asia. Um, next one. Okay, this is just a, a little cartoon which shows the eternal perennial problem between the two countries. And uh, so I, I have always asked myself, why is China's criticism of Japan over the history so strong, continues, etc. So there's, first of all, at the structural level, uh, reconciliation is difficult between different political systems because each denies, in a way, full legitimacy to the other. So for Japan, it's a communist country or a authoritarian country, and for uh, 
uh, and for the um, for China, Japan is uh, U.S. Leke or Meigo de Zogo. Um, then there are religious differences. Um, simply said, uh, in China, like in in Europe, a debt doesn't become a god, but is always a bad person. Uh, then the memory of a victim is always better than that of the victimizer. Uh, Japan doesn't understand about apology. For Japan, it is a one-time uh, thing, a one-off action, whereas it should be an ongoing process and an attitude. And then China's preventive attitude towards uh, Japan's perception of uh, history, the perceived need in China to respond to Japanese provocations like textbooks, slip of tongue by Japanese politicians and so on. And then this very deterministic uh, attitude, view of history in China, even under totally different domestic, regional and international circumstances. So from economic power, to, uh, superpower to militaristic power, as if this is uh, a law of history. And then uh, the lack of guilt leads to repetition. Next one. And then in China, a growing self-confidence, nationalism, moralism, we have heard about this. Criticism of Japan is now deeply anchored. I would say it has become part of China's national identity. And history as a tool to extract concessions, keep Japan down, gain moral high ground, particularly now with China's growing in nationalism, separate Japan from the US. Um, uh, for example, this was very welcome in China, of course, a past US criticism of uh, the Yaskuni shrine visits, substituting Marxist ideology with patriotism. And of course, Japan is a wonderful tool for that. Uh, aggravating factor, of course, in China, the chat rooms, popular press, number of anti-war films, lack of access to up-to-date information on Japan. But also, I would say, in China, sheer info schizophrenia because we have seen how positive the Chinese view of Japan has become until 2021, thanks to the uh, increased visits, uh, 9 million, it was 9 million Chinese visiting uh, and being very impressed by Japan and so on, and Chinese high uh, Japanese high technology, etc. But then on the other hand, they buy uh, the, um, uh, the anti-Japanese anti propaganda. Then the reluctance of my co colleagues in China, uh, Japan specialists in China, to explain Japan, because explaining means in China condoning what Japan has done. Um, and then, of course, if you do uh, something pro-Japan, um, then there is retribution, official retribution or in the social media for any pro-Japan utterances or actions. Um, very briefly here, there was an incident just recently in the temp in a temple in Nanjing. A memorial tablets were uh, established for some war criminal Japanese war criminals, and of course there was severe retribution. Uh, this is just to show um, how uh, officially um, uh, the history issue is presented in Japan. Here is a memorial of the victims in the Nanjing massacre by Japanese invaders. So it's quite clearly the Japanese invaders. Next one. This is a comparison with France. France was occupied by Germany, killed many French people. But this simply says to the memory of Loret, Pierre, and where it was, dead died for the liberation of Perpignan. There's nothing about the Germans there, nothing. But everybody in France, of course, knows it's the Germans who did it. Yeah. So just as a, um, now coming to the uh, international context, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, the history issue is useful to drive a wedge between Japan and its most important U.S. ally. Um, and then uh, Taiwan, talking about Ta Japan's growing links with Taiwan and its joint position, position with U.S., is attacked by China partly also as an attempted repetition of Japan's past occupation of Taiwan, which is, of course, rubbish, but uh, you find it. Uh, then South Korea, for China, South Korea is an ideal partner to criticize Japan over the history issue and to gang up with, uh, um, uh, with China. But the strength of cooperation or coordination with South Korea depends always on Korea's domestic conciliation and the degree of need to keep good relations with US. Um, then with Russia, uh, there are, of course, common 
with China, common historical grievances about Japan, the Russo-Japanese War, Japanese intervention in Siberia, uh, World War II, Japan's demand to regain Russian-occupied islands. But too overt Russian criticism of Japan and ganging up with China on history issue is constrained by balance of power consideration against rising China. I mean, as we, I think, all understand, is as a uh, Russian-Chinese relationship is a marriage of convenience and is uh, constrained, of course, although one may not, may not think about this at the moment. Um, so in Russia, the historical issue with Japan is mostly used for consolidating domestic regime support. Uh, next one is specifically about uh, North Korea. Uh, North Korea's support of J uh, China's Japan criticism is also applied to history issue because of course North Korea has its own history grievances like South Korea, uh, then North Korea's support of its most important ally, uh, China, and Japan seen as a vassal of the US again. Uh, the DPRK, and this is just a quote here now, um, a most recent one on the cooperation between uh, North Korea and China. The DPRK and China are strengthening strategic cooperation and unity to destroy the undisguised hostile policy and military threat of the United States and its followers, this is of course Japan, and defend and advance the common cause of socialism. That's what uh, Kim reportedly uh, said uh, to Xi in February 2020. Um, so I come to my conclusions outlook. Uh, I try to stay within the limits of time. Um, the history issue has many domestic Chinese reasons and serves in Ch China's Inter international relations as a means to isolate Japan, notably from the US, and undermine Japan's international reputation while enhancing China's own moral standing. Now, the, this Chinese use of the history issue in its international relations is not going for the time being losing its attraction for Beijing. And I think uh, Caroline's presentation uh, about textbooks makes clear that the history issue will continue to make relations very difficult, will even harden the attitude on both sides, um, or on all three sides, because South Korea does similar things in its textbooks. And um, so uh, th this um, education man manipulation uh, will continue to uh, make things very difficult for international relations in Northeast Asia. And of course, I think um, the history issue it has become a cloak for China's increasing aggressive foreign and security policy because China wants to enhance its own moral standing by criticizing Japan. And uh, uh, for example, one thing which is no longer mentioned, I think, in, uh, in China's um, propaganda, and please correct me, there is no longer this um, uh, slogan about um, uh, economic uh, superpower becomes automatically, deterministically, also a military superpower, because if the Chinese government has understood, uh, if they emphasize this, uh, this goes back. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reinhardt, uh, for your a presentation on the China's uh, history issue or usage of that history issues uh, with Japan deeply etched into that uh, their national identity or national standards. Um, so may I ask uh, Julio to give us some Words on Very few words, uh, yes, because okay. I'm a last minute replacement and I literally <laughs> scribbled the two pager here. Okay, well, which, which can last two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, it, will, it will last five minutes, hopefully. Uh, good, good. I will limit my um, uh, remarks to, it will do no justice to what Mike, more comprehensive take. Uh, with his eyes, of course, and ears uh, from Washington, D.C., and he has been a close uh, um, st uh, student, uh, really, uh, of uh, these matters for a long time, even an engaged one. Mike would have been really irreplaceable. <clears throat> so we wish him a, sp a speedy recovery. But um, what I do is that I limit what the presentation will be on. 
it will not be on uh, <clears throat> the US own history issues that uh, has vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Japan and um, in fact much, much of Asia because of course as Reiner also mentioned um, it's easier uh, to have a memory of the victim rather than that of the, of the victimizer. I won't deal with uh, 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 issues involving US uh, 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 atrocities or uh, crimes and whatnot vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japan. And I will not deal also uh, with, uh, and I will not deal with uh, uh, the so-called issues involving South Korea. They are important, they are outside of the remit of this conference. And <clears throat> this will also allow me to uh, cl take a closer look at what the US government has done or not done vis-a-vis uh, -vis the history issue amidst uh, uh, between Japan and China. And it's interesting, and I'll start by misquoting uh, uh, Ming Wan, who in his famous book, Sino-Japanese uh, Relations, uh, um, uh, Woodrow Wilson Center and, and Princeton, I think, uh, um, cited uh, an American official who claimed that a degree of uh, uh, conflict or of tension between Japan and China on the history issue specific to the Yasukuni Shrine visits was actually beneficial to the US. It was keeping the US uh, important and relevant to both the US-Japan alliance but also to China. Um, and that cynicism <clears throat> has actually been superseded, I have found in the fieldwork research in Japan and, uh, and the US, uh, with actually a degree of worry uh, on the history issue. And um, I'll start uh, from, uh, <clears throat> from a famous quote um, that uh, was made repeatedly also by John Kerry, the Secretary of State who succeeded Hillary Clinton under the Obama administration. Kerry famously said uh, to a bunch of journalists uh, uh, in a press in a closed door press conference that the biggest problem in Asia <laughs> was not Xi Jinping nor was it Kim Jong Un but Abe Shinzo's uh, uh, return to power. <clears throat> this, of course, has had much to do with uh, uh, the Obama administration's uh, uh, "quote unquote" doctrine of not being in, uh, not doing stupid shit, as uh, uh, Obama uh, and I'm citing Obama and of not being involved also in military tensions. And there was a brewing one between Japan and China around the Senkaku Diaoyu Island dispute that the Abe administration inherited. But the Abe, the Abe, Abe himself was a true believer in, uh, um, as Caroline has also made clear through his imprint on patriotic education and what Abe would call driving away from a masochistic education and really driving away from the so-called post-war regime. Abe was a true believer of the need to foster a patriotic Japan that um, um, did without the shackles of the US occupation, that kind of stifled uh, Japanese uh, uh, patriotism, uh, Japanese pride in country, and also <clears throat> Japan's sense of, uh, Imperial Japan's sense of the nice things that it actually had brought to Asia, because, and this has much to do with Abe's, uh, and I'm quoting Abe, I'm, I'm looking at Abe's uh, mm -hmm. uh, persona and legacy. He was, of course, uh, the grandson of Kishinobusuke, who famously um, was uh, involved uh, in uh, uh, developmental policies of occupied Manchuria, the puppet state of Manchukuo, including forced labor, <clears throat> and who famously then sat uh, as Minister of Munitions uh, in the Tojo cabinet that, cabinet that declared war against the United States. And Abe repeatedly uh, wants to bring back the merits of also of what the Japanese Empire had brought uh, to Asia, that is, that it brought modernity to the Korean Peninsula, it brought modernity to Taiwan. You can understand uh, that romantic idealism also as being part and parcel of his, uh, personal, of his personal background. And that's why in my research uh, in, uh, um, in Tokyo and DC, I have found evidence of uh, the US President uh, George W. Bush sending uh, 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 trusted uh, uh, envoys to to speak with then Chief Cabinet Secretary Abe in 2005, in 2006, when he was likely to succeed uh, Koizumi Junichiro, to avoid uh, stirring 
trouble on the history issue because the president does not understand the history issue. This was the message. <clears throat> this was not just about alliance management with South Korea. This had much to do also with uh, the potential <clears throat> uh, visit by Abe to the Yaskuni Shrine. Because a visit by Abe to the Yaskuni Shrine, as you can understand from this broad overview of Abe's person, would have been very different from the visit of Koizumi, who was a nationalist, yes, but was never really, he was a populist nationalist, but was never a true believer as, as, as Abe used to be. Luckily, Abe had changed his views. Um, we have had testimony, heard testimonies uh, also uh, yesterday that Abe's <clears throat> growing awareness of uh, uh, Japan's aggression, really, uh, to, to uh, uh, its East Asian neighbors during its imperial heydays. And what we have witnessed, however, has been uh, um, a reboot of Abe as uh, he visits the Yaskuni. Uh, he basically kickstarts the moratorium consensus not to visit the uh, shrine devoted to the souls, 2.5 million souls of those who fought and died for the emperor. <clears throat> including uh, 14 Class A war criminals who were enshrined secretly in, 19, uh, in 1978. And this is the bone of contention of Yaskuni, I should have made it clear earlier. And so Abe visits Yaskuni in December of 2013, and the State Department, the Tokyo Embassy, the US Embassy in Tokyo famously uh, remarks its own disappointment. But um, the Obama administration, I think, has elicited then uh, uh, promises, promises that are clear from the fact that uh, uh, Japan and China um, start uh, defrosting their relationship um, uh, by the end of 2014 and uh, the beginning of 2015. This likely entailed uh, promises on Yaskuni, promises that were, had not to be made public because it needed to save face to Abe who again, it was the princeling of the nationalists and couldn't possibly be seen by his, um, uh, by his uh, um, constitu hardcore constituency as, make, as, making, as caving in uh, on issues dear to them. But what we see then in 2014 and 20, in 2015 especially, and this is my conclusion, is that we see history statecraft at play. Uh, we see uh, uh, the United States government uh, conceding uh, to uh, Japan's willingness to move on on the history issue by allowing Abe to make a statement uh, at the Joint House of Congress uh, where <clears throat> Abe remarks the fact that bitter enemies uh, uh, can uh, finally uh, move towards an alliance of hope and towards a future. This future messaging was repeatedly done strategically by the Abe administration with key allies such as uh, Australia, with a similar speech made in Canberra in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with, um, also with the Philippines. And it's also a way to emphasize the fact that uh, uh, while China and South Korea are <clears throat> um, pointing the finger at Japan, Japan has moved on. Japan and other allies have moved on from the history. And this has been allowed also by uh, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, accept, acceptance of Abe's uh, uh, willingness to concede uh, also a degree of um, uh, pragmatism. So when we talk about Abe's pragmatism, we should remember that it comes from power relationships uh, uh, and dependence uh, on the U.S. Uh, uh, military aegis. This is often uh, <clears throat> somehow forgotten that Abe developed that pragmatism because he, he listened to his close advisors. His pragmatism depended very much also by the fact that in order to have effective deterrence vis-a-vis -vis China, you needed a strong U.S.-Japan alliance. And the Secretary, and, you know, and Secretary of State Kerry remarks that I highlighted at the beginning of this, com of this presentation suggests that there was a degree of uh, uh, suspicion and mistrust vis-a-vis uh, -vis Abe, mistrust that had to be dispelled. And so this is how we get uh, to uh, the landmark visit by uh, um, um, Obama uh, to Hiroshima, a visit that still elicited uh, uh, politicization and problems uh, <clears throat> in, uh, in D.C. Trump, for instance, uh, even uh, uh, um, 
lamented uh, that visit because, of course, Hiroshima was right. It was good to bomb Hiroshima because it was uh, it ended the war. Um, and similarly, we uh, we get uh, shortly thereafter to uh, Abe's uh, uh, visit to Pearl Harbor. And I could conclude uh, here, and I think I've spoken actually for ten minutes. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Exchange uh, trade places. <laughs> wow, wow. Julia, thanks very much indeed. I knew that a you know, few words means <laughs> But actually, quite useful to somewhat relativize the, uh, you know, Abe's legacy in this history issue, too. Please, uh, uh, you know, please take the floor. Well, I, I also jump in here at the last minute, and I, I come from a very, very German perspective, and I can actually build on. What Reinhardt said in the beginning that China uses this history issue also to isolate uh, Japan, um, because I, what I want to talk about is how uh, delegations of Chinese uh, from the late 90s, and I would say the first half of the 2000s, uh, came to Berlin, and you know, at every conference and at every meeting, they would tell me and my colleagues that the Germans who had dealt with their own past in such a successful way, we should go to Japan and tell Japan what to do. Sure. Um, and I always try to explain that, uh, you know, this is not going to happen, although I think there was a, a joint uh, school book or textbook commission, maybe in the early 90s or something, uh, between Japan and Germany, not because Germany pushed itself on, ja uh, on Japan, but because at that time there was probably more, you know, of a willingness to address the issue. But the, the point I want to make is that the Chinese have a very romanticized uh, uh, image of how um, Germany dealt with its own past and how smooth this process was. And I, I go back to what was said earlier, this process never ends. It can be, you know, uh, revived, these anti-German feelings can be revived. And there are actually three layers in the case of Germany. One is the actual process of denazification. Then there is how to confront your own history and assess what you have done. In our case, it was a complete, you know, uh, admittance to our guilt. And then there is the question of reconciliation with your neighbors, all the countries you have wronged. And this is a completely different ballgame, even if you have dealt with the first two layers half successful, there is still a lot of work to do if you want to have actual reconciliation. And I think the German process was very, very rocky because the actual denazification process after World War II was very superficial. It did not last very long when, you know, all the judges and the officials, the, the bureaucracy was back in their old places simply because there was no capacity, there were no educated people that were not Nazis who could fill these positions. So this process was a very superficial one. Um, and I don't know how, you know, the, the dealing with the, the people who were responsible, uh, how this happened in, in Japan after the war. Yes, we had the Nuremberg uh, process, uh, um, uh, trials, and, uh, but this was only the highest level and not even all of the highest level Nazis were, were caught. And then I think for the German experience, it was very important that the a 1960s generation, that was the generation that pushed their parents to come clean on where, what they did during World War II, where they stood, and, you know, did they have any responsibility? Because after the war, out of a sudden, you have a, a whole people of resistance fighters that were never, with, with whom it was never okay uh, that we had uh, Adolf Hitler. Um, so I think this is probably one of the dimensions that the Japanese process is missing, that there was this bottom-up um, approach to 
at a very, very basic level, you know, this was within families and it was very, very painful because parents just wanted to forget this time. So uh, I think this was a second layer. And then there is the reconciliation with the neighbors. And I would say this is still ongoing. But uh, Germany, and it was not an uncontroversial uh, thing, uh, and the most controversial was probably Willy Brandt kneeling down in Warsaw because the uh, conservative uh, politicians at the time were not in favor of such a you know, gesture. Uh, just like in the US, you had a lot of criticism when Obama bowed too low to the Japanese emperor. So this kind of controversy we also had in Germany. Um, and uh, of course, I think with France, um, we probably had the most success, if you will, uh, because it developed into a very close political relationship. Uh, with Poland, I would say half successful. Uh, as you said, it's, you know, there is always a time to bring this back on the table. And the most, uh, of course, difficult process was with Israel because reconciliation was not even the topic, but in the beginning, Germany just tried to support Israel economically in every way possible. And I think there is an interesting comparison to Japan here. Uh, we did not expect that Israel forgives us or anything. We helped in the hope that this would develop into a normal relationship, which probably will never be the case in a way. But I think the approach of Japan, all the ODA uh, in, you know, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Southeast Asia, also all the economic uh, support you extended to China was sort of a silent way of, you know, wanting to make things right. I don't know if I in interpret this correctly, but it didn't work in the way I mean, we did the apologies first, and we apologized a lot of times. And I think uh, what always strikes me when I come to Tokyo, there is no memorial, you know, um, like we have these all over Europe, we have these uh, memorials for the unknown soldier who died which I think is uh, similar to what the, the picture that Rein, uh, Reinhardt showed it doesn't point fingers, it just mourns the losses. And um, so in Tokyo, I mean, in Berlin, if you send students out, you can make them go to 10, 15 different places where this is com commemorated. And in Japan, in Tokyo, it's just not there. So um, uh, I, there, there are, of course, these differences. But what I wanted to say, it's a very painful process. The Chinese, of course, never gave up that we would educate the Japanese how to, how to do this. But I think you cannot educate anybody else. And I remember that wasn't Kerry also the one who said, Japan and Korea are like two people sitting in a boat. And they row and row and row, but they only look backwards. Maybe the window has closed for this sort of process, um, and maybe there is only the option of sort of growing over the, the history problem, because you will never uh, solve the, the territorial issues by international law or with historical arguments. This will never happen. Um, so this is all I had to say. Thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, very much indeed. Uh, uh, the, um, it was quite uh, illuminating in the sense of, uh, you know, to uh, explain Japan's situation with some contrast with the German cases, uh, as well as some, perhaps some similarities. Perhaps at the level of fact, don't we have a Chidori Gafuchi for the unknown soldiers' uh, tomb? So it's not just Yasukuni who we. Uh, all souls are merited, and we have to. No, no, no. But the, we have Chidori Gafuchi uh, as a national, you know, uh, site for unknown souls. Please. Yes, kind of hard to find. 
two no, fingers. It's, it's, it's around the Ascurin. Yeah. Now, in fact, and this plugs into the presentation uh, that uh, yeah that I, I made. When there was the first US-Japan uh, Security Consultative Committee held in Tokyo in um, um, the autumn of 2013, uh, Secretary of State Kerry and I think it was Ash Carter to preempt Abe from visiting Yaskuni visited Chidori Gafuchi. Mm -hmm. They visited Chidori Gafuchi and laid, uh, 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 yes, and it was a message saying, there is also that place you could visit. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I wanted to add um, is that, yes, there is still a uh, also a lot of um, uh, um, stress on the victimization, as usually happens with like the Hiroshima Peace Memorial. But in Japan, there are a lot of peace memorials. There are. And these peace memorials are not just about the victimized Japanese, but also at the, uh, the bankrupt uh, legacy of empire. Yeah. Yeah. And and Caroline wants to jump in because she's a very real expert here. Sorry, Caroline. <laughs> Hi, no, I just wanted to follow up on the Chidori Gafuchi thing. Uh, because actually on August the 15th every year, the Prime Minister goes to Chidori Gafuchi and, and to the Bodokan as well. So actually, it, it, it's very low profile and it gets very little coverage in any media. Uh, I mean, she's covered in the Japanese media. I think it was covered on the BBC once, but um, there is that that memorial. But of course, Yasukuni just completely overshadows it. But they, the Japanese prime ministers do visit that uh, that shrine for what it's worth. Uh, memorial, sorry. Uh, and, and just to add to it, uh, at one point, I think the Democratic Party of Japan um, proposed to uh, develop the uh, yep. Fuji into a national cemetery yeah. like Arlington, but I don't think it, ha it happened. Yeah. Also talking about uh, monuments uh, dedicated to foreign victims, there's one in Hiroshima for Korean victims of the nuclear bombing. And it's actually a, a controversy because for a long time, this this monument was excluded from the Peace Park of Hiroshima until I think 1970s. So it, was, it took a while for them to recognize there are also foreign victims uh, in this war in Japan. Yeah, anybody to jump on? Please go ahead. Uh, use the microphone. Hi, um, I've got a question for Caroline, if I may. Um, hopefully you can hear me. If you need me to speak louder, just let me know. Um, I'm very curious because if you look at when the history issue is invoked in textbooks and 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 when it's invoked by by sort of by state leadership in, in both Japan and China, is this simply a way of mit of sort of, of of popular distraction. So, for instance, in Japan, in Japan, in, in, in sorry, in China, in 2012, when we had the anti-Japan nationalist protests, the CCP were very, very keen to get these protests going, but to cut them off at a particular threshold, so that the so that the protests did not turn into anti-CCP protests. And so, I'm just curious as to, from your own work, do you see sort of ebbs and flows trends in terms of textbook issues when these issues are invoked the timing of publications for instance and sort of what's going on domestically in in japan and in china yeah it, it's absolutely all of that um, oh, please go ahead yeah. oh sorry it is absolutely all of that and there are ebbs and flows and if i could predict when the next history issue is going to explode I'd, I'd be a rich woman um but the, i mean it, it depends of uh, we've all talked about the way china uses the history problem but japan uses the history problem as well um so you know this instrumentalist explanation exists really or applies for both sides um but i i was i was just struck by what gudrun just said about whether the the window is closed now for any sort of resolution of the history problem. And I, I've been thinking exactly the same thing, largely because China and Japan now in their textbook content and therefore in their narratives about the war are moving even further apart. So we had a period of time 
and talking about ebbs and flows, there's been sort of every every 20 years or so, there's this rush towards some sort of uh, reconciliation, a, a greater form of reconciliation. And this is where grassroots groups gets involved. And the last time this happened was the 1990s, early 2000s, and now it's fizzled out. So I'm hopeful that somehow, uh, when we're not talking about territorial disputes or you know the possibility of conflict in tai Taiwan, that I think the history problem will come to the fore again. And I wonder what form that discussion will take, precisely because, as I've just said, actually the, the narratives are moving further apart. And where there was once a chance for some form of joint cooperation and sort of the heyday of joint history projects, which interestingly was around the time of Koizumi, who, who suggested that this sort of thing should happen, and where academics were actually able to, Japanese and Chinese academics, like some of them sitting in this room, were actually able to talk about this stuff. You know, there was a, a potential for some sort of, not, not agreement on the details of history, because that's not going to happen, but at least there was a dialogue. That dialogue, it seems to me, is currently under a hiatus. I, I, history won't go away and the history problem won't go away, but the form it will take next time it comes around, I think will be very interesting precisely because rather than getting closer, actually the two sides are moving much further apart because of these different grand strategies that they're both pursuing. But it's, it's so very closely related to everything that is about domestic politics, it's about events, it's very event driven, it's about provocative actions by a Japanese prime minister visiting the Yasukuni shrine. Um, and there's there's certainly a pattern to what happens when these issues explode. There isn't necessarily a pattern to when the issues are going to hit the press. It, it absolutely depends on how useful it is to any of the parties. Me now? Are you, are you going to have a question? Okay, this is more like a comment uh, in reaction to the, is it on? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Carolyn, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, it's a reaction to the panelists' uh, uh, comments here. Um, when Caroline and uh, Reinhardt and everyone talked about the uh, uh, governments in China and Japan uh, trying to promote uh, uh, patriotism in the textbooks, uh, what comes to my mind is that uh, actually every country does that. Um, the, uh, the Russians obviously are doing a lot of that. Uh, the Americans, so the Republican Party is trying to censor the textbooks right now, and, and they hate that uh, we we are not uh, glorifying U.S. history enough. And uh, the Italians, uh, the other day I talked to uh, Julia because we discovered this uh, monument to unknown soldier in Rome. And so every country promotes uh, patriotism. Uh, that's nothing uh, special about Japan and, and China. But what's special here is that uh, in nationalism literature, we talk about the differenti differentiation between nationalism and patriotism. Um, in other words, patriotism, if we use it in a more strict way, is that uh, uh, it's more about the love or the attachment to your own country without having to dislike or uh, you know, hate other countries. Where well, nationalism, you need the other, the negative other, uh, in contrast to which that you would uh, promote your self-esteem. Um, so I think what's, what makes Japan and China's uh, patriotic education special is that uh, they, they, they do have this negative other to be a very critical part of it. So whenever they encourage uh, their kids to love their country, at the same time they tell their kids that the, the, you have this enemy outside of this country, outside of our country that uh, have victimized us, wronged us, uh, and uh, have not been nice to us, uh, taking away our territories and so on and so forth. So this otherness that's uh, particularly poisonous uh, in Chinese and Japanese historical narrative. Well, thank you. Uh, Caroline, if, if, if I may, may I ask uh, Takahara-sensei first to comment? And if there is any time, I would like to make some comments uh, uh, be before putting uh, uh, Reinhardt and Caroline to respond. Is it all right? Yeah. Okay, Takahara Sensei, please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. This has been too interesting for me to leave. I should go back to something else. But anyhow, uh, thank you so much for a very interesting, exciting uh, discussion. I would like to make a small contribution by, um, first of all, uh, providing you with the fact that 
very interestingly, um, have you been to the Yasukuni Shrine? Maybe some of you have. But uh, besides the big shrine, um, there, is, there are a couple of small shrines. And one of the small shrines called Chindesha is actually to console the souls of every uh, body who died in uh, war, uh, including foreigners. <laughs> so um, if, you, if, uh, if political leaders wanted to visit the Yaskuni shrine, uh, he or she should visit both the main part and the other shrine. Uh, if he or she really he, he goes to the shrine to pray for peace uh, and to console the souls of those who uh, sacrificed their lives uh, and uh, were killed uh, in, in the war. But that's a very small um, piece of information for you. And um, secondly, as far as Japan's concerned, you know, some conservative people, not only politicians, but those in society, um, think like this. They, they think that we shouldn't um, teach the children the mistakes that the um, country made in the past because if you teach the mistakes in the past then the children won't um, take pride in their own nation and uh, i think many japanese are against that idea we should not hide the mistakes that we made and i would rather feel ashamed by uh, us, uh, if our country wanted to hide the mistakes you know that actually took took place. Uh, but uh, having said that, um, there are certain extreme cases that make those conservative people worried. Uh, for example, um, my teacher in junior high school was a member of the Japanese Communist Party. And when he taught history of the Korean War, uh, he told us that it started by an invasion of the United States. <laughs> and uh, no, no, no one seemed to question that. I mean, no parent uh, protested against that. So uh, there were many uh, members of um, the Communist Party uh, amongst the teachers um, at, at that time. And now I look back and, uh, you know, uh, there were some extreme cases. And nowadays it's the um, fans of Korean pop singers and so on who, started to, who, who start to say that, uh, yes, uh, the Takeshima should be called doctor and uh, the island belongs to Korea. <laughs> Why? Because a certain pop singer um, argues that that way. It's like a joke, uh, but it does happen. And um, <laughs> uh, those extreme cases um, do exist. Uh, that's the second um, point. And the third point is about um, China. Um, when uh, the 2012 clash over the Senkakus happened. After that, for a few years at least, um, certain Chinese diplomats went around the world saying lies <laughs> about uh, the Japanese government's attitude towards the war. I mean, the Second World War, the invasion of, of China. Uh, a very well-known um, diplomat, uh, I, I heard this myself, you know, I was the only Japanese in the room. Perhaps she didn't realize that there was a Japanese in the room. But anyhow, uh, she started to argue that Japan has never apologized to China uh, about the in invasion. And I had to raise my hand and ask questions. And she pretended that she had forgotten. Um, but it was only five years before that, in 2007, that when Wen Jiabao uh, came to Japan, he made the very courageous speech at the Japanese Diet um, saying that on many occasions the Japanese government and leaders have stated their position on historical issues, admitting that Japan committed aggression and expressing deep remorse and apology to the victimized countries. The Chinese government and people positively appreciate the, posi the position they have taken. When I heard that, I was most impressed because he had the courage to, to uh, accept the apology from the ag aggressor, which is a very important, sufficient condition yeah, uh, for reconciliation. The necessary condition is for the aggressor uh, to um, admit that uh, he or she did uh, very wrong things to the victims and apologize. Uh, but that's not enough, is it? Uh, it has to, I mean, the victim side has to accept the apology. And he was the first senior statesman to accept it, uh, accept the apology 
uh, in a very square way. So um, I had hoped that there would be followers of Wen Jiabao, but it has never happened to, to this day. Uh, that's the small contribution I wanted to make. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Takahara Sensei. Uh, I, I'm sure Caroline wants to talk a lot, but uh, the, um, would you keep your comment short? Um, I only wanted to come back what what you raised. Um, I think uh, this is a lesson since 1919, the May 4th movement, that a, a protest that starts as a you know turning toward external uh, events will turn against the own government. This is in the beginning it's a Versailles Treaty, but then it turns against the, the Chinese politicians who signed the Versailles Treaty and they were uh, protested as being uh, pro-Japanese -Jap because the German possessions in China were given to Japan uh, in the Versailles Treaty. And you have the same during the Asian financial crisis with the protests in anti-Chinese protests in Indonesia, when you have then protests in China protesting the protests because they accused the government of being too weak. And of course, all these protests are always instrumentalized by the government for their own, you know, and, and if it goes too far, they are very quick in, in putting it down. Uh, so, Reinhard, would you like to? No, uh, very briefly, uh, thank you very much, uh, Akio, for uh, your comments. And I me meant by one time, uh, one of uh, apology, not in a literal sense because obviously there have been, and you're obviously quite right, uh, that it has to be uh, responded to. Uh, so that's what I mean. And uh, the first point you made also, uh, the right, uh, right uh, politicians in Japan, they, they don't want that uh, the children are um, taught a masochistic view of history, because they say, if they hear about the bad things only, then um, they will not be able to love Japan. I mean, as a German with our history, I just cannot accept this. Um, then, uh, just also to de define briefly, you know, um, a lot of um, textbook changes which uh, Caroline mentioned are really defensive. Uh, defensive in the sense of um, uh, giving a Japan's view of the on the territorial issue. Uh, they're more and more defensive. I mean, the Korea does the same, and of course, Japan, uh, China as well. I, I just wished that at least in Japan, one could explain territorial issues first from a broader sense. Territorial issues are difficult, have historical, uh, legal, and so on, a background, etc. Instead of just saying, uh, 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 Dokto or Takahima is Japanese uh, territory, or the same about Senkaku, I, I would prefer that the problematic of a territorial issue is being explained before going into details. Um, Sorry, that's just that. Thank you very much. Um, maybe, yeah, right. Before before passing to Caroline, may I just jump in myself as a, just abusing the chair's power? But we have started 30 minutes late, right? So uh, we're just five minutes late, but uh, we can extend maybe five, 10 minutes. I just wonder, you know, this is a sort of uh, minefield, and then I really have to be careful. And then I really utterly share the Caroline's concerns about this historical revisionism in Japan. But at the same time, you know, I myself was one of the editors of the uh, Tokyo Shoseki's uh, uh, Seike, Seike Politics and Economics, uh, you know, textbook of, uh, for the high school uh, over the past 10 years or so. I, I just simply don't have the uh, my own, you know, personal impression that the, uh, this sort of historical revisionism really uh, penetrated into the uh, textbook, uh, you know, makers, uh, uh, including myself. Uh, you know, the uh, editor-in-chief is uh, Atsushi Sugita of Hosei University, uh, uh, and I myself uh, uh, are in a sort of liberal camp. And, you know, apart from these territorial issues, uh, you know, we have kept Kono Danwa, we have kept the uh, US young comfort woman. Uh, we have kept, I think, Choyoko as well. And the, uh, um, 
And what's else? The um, the uh, scene from the 1997, the um, after the year 2017, the, all the adopted um, textbook refers to this comfort woman issues. You know, there was none before, you know, in the 1980s and the beginning of 1990s. So it's not just regressive, uh, you know, uh, reactive, uh, reactionary, you know, forces just, you know, going on in Japan. But uh, I think there are some, you know, the elements remaining. And, and, and also the, this awful reactionary textbook, the Atarashi Dekishi no Kyokasho, the, uh, the new history textbook is not really, you know, adopted by the, uh, you know, the, the school teachers, uh, you know, uh, 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 in the classroom. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, um, it's, uh, I think the process might, might have been a little bit, little bit more, you know, perhaps double layered or a little bit more complex. And uh, if I may add uh, the, uh, uh, since 1990s, uh, we have had a significant progress, for instance, in in the process of uh, having a slightly more re re reconciled relationship with South Korea, uh, you know, starting from Kono Danwa, you know, Murayama Danwa, and Obuchi, you know, the uh, Kim Dejun partnerships, and uh, and if you look at the um, um, uh, 2008 Kan Danwa you know, the uh, Khan statement, the uh, Demo Democratic Party's premier's, you know, the uh, statement, you know, uh, there was a reference to the, you know, the, uh, uh, the things happened against the will of uh, uh, Korean people. You know, this wasn't the case in Konodan, and, but there was, you know, sort of accumulated um, uh, reference, uh, you know, the sort of improvement. And it was unfortunate that the, this uh, comfort woman, you know, sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, initiative and the Abe government went, went nowhere uh, with the previous government of South Korea. But, and that, that is really damaging. But still, uh, you know, the, uh, this sort of, uh, you know, the slight divisions uh, uh, and some worrisome tendencies in Japan coincided with the, uh, you know, this sort of uh, parallel processes. So I, I think the, that is the uh, sort of uh, thing that we also have to keep in mind. That, that's my view, but anyway, um, somebody else to join? Uh, otherwise I would ask uh, Carolyn. Yeah, and, and, oh, okay, please go ahead. Karol oh. Jankowski from University of Łódź. I have a question to Caroline as well. Uh, to what extent is the oh, hello? To what extent is the neighborhood uh, uh, countries clause still uh, in effect? Because it has never been retracted. There were attempts to do that by a LDP panel in 2014, as far as I remember, or so. It has never been retracted. But is it only a dead letter, or is it circumvented, or to what extent it? Uh, uh, affects the screening process in the Ministry of Education. Thank you. So I would like to ask uh, Caroline to make comment and uh, ask Reinhardt to wind up the entire session. Oh, oh. <laughs> is it okay? <laughs> Please. Okay, thank you. There's there's quite a lot to go out there, and thank you all for your comments. So. Um, Maybe I can just pick up on one of Inan, Inan's points about the self-other issue and the fact that in patriotic education, one of the outcomes is that you have a negative other. And I think, I think what's interesting in the Chinese case is that, yes, you have a negative other uh, in the case of descriptions of the anti-Japanese war, but actually that negative other has changed over time. So in the first instance, Japan was an absent other the, the word Japan was not mentioned in the textbooks of the 1950s and 70s. It was understood, it was sort of implicit. And the negative other in those descriptions was the Gormindang. Um, that, of course, changed in the 1980s, and the Gormindang was sort of, uh, sort of um, enveloped uh, as, as part of the you know, the, the victory, uh, the, the, the victorious uh, side. And then Japan the Japanese army became the negative other, a negative other, because of course they were traitors as well. 
Um, and then in the 1990s, 2000s, Japan became an extremely negative other. And at that point, you had in, in Chinese history textbooks some really quite graphic uh, descriptions of atrocities, um, you know, chemical weapons and the Nanjing massacre and everything. And that has now subsided again. So Japan is still a negative other, but it, we've re we sort of returned a little bit to the pre 2000s narrative. So if you take a broad sweep over time in terms of China's patriotic education and the, the portrayal of a negative other or Japan as a ne negative other in textbooks, it really changes. Um, and and the, the, the length of the descriptions changes as well. So at one point, uh, descriptions of the uh, Japanese war of, uh, the war of resistance against Japan was reduced drastically to some like four or five pages, and then it was expanded. So this is a really movable feast in Chinese textbooks. There, there isn't a static story to be told. And I think that reinforces the notion that these these narratives change over time for a reason um, and the communist party has a certain message to tell uh, at, at a certain point in time and th but then the other thing i'd like to say about sort of self other portrayals having looked at many many textbooks on the chinese and japanese side and having moved beyond the asia pacific war what has struck me is actually the the variety of others china and japan as others um, and the fact that there's a much bigger story being told that of course the asia pacific war you know plays a central role in history textbooks but actually china appears as teacher uh, in japanese history textbooks or uh, japan appears as modernizer so there are many many varied others china and japan as each other's other appear in many many different guises and of course we never get to see that so what i've tried to do in my book is follow a chinese and japanese school child through through their through their schooling years and to demonstrate the encounters that they each have with the other in their textbooks now of course that's far from reality but it just tells a very different story to the one that i think we're used to hearing which is that japan is a very negative other in chinese textbooks and all chinese school kids learn about japan is what they did to us during the war actually the the picture is much more varied and similarly on the japanese side china and, and Chinese people appear and disappear in different editions of the text. So what I'm trying to do in my book is give a much broader picture of mutual perceptions through textbooks, which actually moves away from my apparent obsession with, with how the war is, uh, is portrayed. So I hope in time when I get this book published that uh, that will be of interest. And then um, Ken's point, I mean, I, I, I'd love to have a conversation with you uh, knowing that you now have, have uh, been on the editorial board of Tokyo Shoseki, and if you raise a really important point that I wanted to try and squeeze in earlier, but I didn't. And I think the response of text, the textbooks themselves is really interesting. So I think my, my point is that there's an intention on the part of the government through cabinet decision or, or very quick changes to the to the rules about textbooks. Um, so there's an intention there. But I think the textbooks and Tokyo Shoseki is a great example because it's the market leader. And I always look at Tokyo Shoseki first. And then I look at the, the peripheral ones like the horrible Fusosha one and the, and the left leaning, um, left leaning Manabisha one. So Tokyo Shoseki sort of sits in the middle. And I, I, I agree. I think textbook editors have some agency that, that we never really get to learn about unless we talk to people like you. Um, and I think what's really interesting in the most recent round of changes is in relation to the comfort women, the Duke and the, the, the reference to army has gone, I believe. Uh, I haven't looked at all of them yet because I haven't been able to get to Japan yet. And um, so there is this whittling away. The government, I think, is trying to just pick away at the, the, the progress that was made in the 1990s by textbooks like Tokyo Shoseki, but there's just a picking away at things which, which worries me. But also what I found was really canny on the part, of, really clever on the part of text, some textbooks this time around was that they made specific reference to the fact that it was due to the, a cabinet decision that they had to make changes to the textbook. 
that references to the Connor statement or whatever had to be uh, in sort of um, just mitigated slightly. So I think I think you raise a brilliant point, and that almost needs to be another chapter in my book. So I need to come and chat to you at some point. And then um, finally, um, Carol, nice to see you. Um, yeah, the, the the neighboring countries clause in the textbook authorization textbook authorization standards was there was a real worry in 2014 that the Ministry of Education was going to scrap it and and they didn't and I don't think they could have done um I don't think it's a dead letter uh you know I think it stands there written in black and white and uh maybe maybe Ken should answer this but I I do think that there is um an awareness that that is there and there's a point beyond which the government can't go um, and that textbook authors as we've just heard textbook editors will not be pushed so yeah I think I think it, it still stands and uh, at that wobble in 2014 was a real concern but um but they managed to stand firm and, it, and it's it's still it's still extant okay sorry I've bumbled on for too long <laughs> Just, he has exhausted our, you know, break, break time. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, I found it a very interesting uh, session, uh, many things, um, and uh, very difficult to, uh, to summarize it, but uh, maybe one point is uh, particular uh, what uh, Caroline has uh, shown, the reshaping of the narrative in the textbooks. And um, a second point uh, for me is the defensive role of hist history narrative for immediate foreign policy issues, disputes like territorial issues and uh, the um, uh, comfort woman issue. And certainly, finally, and that is, I find very uh, sad that the history issue will unfortunately stay with us. We don't know yet how it will reemerge, how it will be uh, operationalized by the various uh, governments, Korea, Japan, uh, um, China, and uh, that the um, what we heard about the narrative reshaped narrative will not help but on the contrary will solidify the positions and make a compromise around the table even more difficult in future that i think is a very sad uh, uh, con uh, conclusion i have to draw but it was very interesting and many thanks to everybody yeah. thank you thank you thanks a lot uh, to two speakers and to excellent substitute <laughs> as well. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. We can end this session.